The following program is underwritten by the Nevada Irrigation District. Since 1921, providing clean and healthy drinking and irrigation water to more than 24,000 homes, farms, schools, and businesses in Nevada and Placer counties. Lou Sitzer. Thanks for tuning in to NCTV interviews. We have Martin Webb with us today who is the owner and founder of Planet Solar. Welcome Martin. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's great. Uh, we chatted uh, a little bit before the show began and um, learned that we have a lot of mutual interests and uh, the primary one being energy use and energy conservation and ideas about what we can do uh, on today's today's situation with um, you know, rising oil prices, rising energy prices, and uh, the various options that are ahead. So just to go a little bit into uh, your background, Martin, I know that you uh, have established Planet Solar. So tell us a little bit about your involvement with uh, what got you into the whole idea of working with solar and in energy fields. Well, it's, um, it's something that certainly is attractive in that it's a technology that addresses several different challenges that we as a people on this planet face and even in, in the local level. So it, it, it takes care of macroscopic issues as well as microscopic in that it takes care of uh, energy issues, pollution and environmental issues, economic issues. And I've always even been... Even foreign policy issues. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Military issues. Extent. So, and I'm, I'm, I've always been a numbers person, and it's fascinating when it comes to implementing renewable energy technologies, in a lot of cases it comes down to running the numbers. Um, you either have a good location or you don't for solar or wind or hydro, and for most folks it's just a matter of running the numbers. Is it cheaper to produce your own power with renewable energy or to buy utility power? And so, it certainly feels good to be doing something that has a great benefit to the world at large and the public. Um, at the same time, the, the ability to do a lot of math is exciting to me, too. So, so give us a little sense of uh, the uh, sort of the penetration of the solar companies into the area. You know, I know there are not just Planet Solar, there are other companies that are doing similar work. What is the usage and how is that growing or declining as, as you see it? Well, this area, the, the greater Sierra Nevada foothills, gold country area, it has quite a competitive market for uh, solar businesses, which is really good news for the consumer. I've plotted um, charts showing exactly how our local prices compare to average prices for solar in California, and they're much lower than the rest of the state because we have so many choices for people to go to. As an example, uh, the Auburn Home Show, for instance. We attended that this year and set up a booth, and there were 12 solar companies all together. And in mm -hmm. some parts of the state and in most of the country, you can't even open a phone book and find a solar listing. Whereas here, you have a choice of almost a dozen different companies. So it's, um, it's quite an amazing community for implementing renewable energy. Folks that get the concept, they usually have a good site for uh, solar unless they're way up in the trees, which we discover quite a bit. Um, but pe people really get the economics. And there's been enough installations out there that when we do booths and events, folks no longer come up to us and say, well, if it's so great and, and pays for itself so fast, how come I don't see it everywhere? <laughs> Instead, 
we have seen over the last couple of years a slight change. People come up to our booths and say, my neighbor's got it and now I'm interested, or my family member has it or my friend has it. So we finally hit that point where enough people have it that they know it works, they know it's affordable, they know it pays for itself. And part of what I like to do um, when I'm talking to the public is um, sort of kill those myths that are out there, the notion that solar is too expensive and you should keep waiting, which as I always tell everybody, when you're, when you're reading about solar, it's usually national media and that's the message that's getting across. You're either reading Time or Newsweek or Mother Jones or you may be reading your local newspaper, but it'll oftentimes be an Associated Press article crafted for the whole nation talking about advances in solar and it's too expensive. And to be quite honest, for most of the country that's true. Most of the country has really cheap utility prices and relatively expensive solar prices because there are no state programs. California is quite the opposite. We have expensive utility prices and we have cheap solar prices. Mm -hmm. And so once folks have a chance to learn what the reality is for our area, then they understand, hey, it's, it's time for us to do it. California oftentimes is the pioneer for the rest of the country in many issues, and this is no different. Right. There have been, I know in the past, incentive programs, and currently I think it doesn't the state offer and the federal government offer incentives. Mm -hmm. If you install a solar electric system, that's connected to the utility lines, there is a state rebate program that'll cover about 25% of the cost. If you're off-grid, and there are certainly people up in our rural areas who are off the power lines, that rebate doesn't apply, and that's simply because the money that funds the rebate program comes from ratepayers. Everybody that pays a PG&E bill that's listing the program, the, every month they're contributing you know, 10, 15 cents, 25 cents, 50 cents, depending on the size of their bill, every month it goes into this state rebate program. So the solar systems that take advantage of this program are supposed to give some sort of benefit also to the grid, which helps uh, you know, keep up the reliability and, and that type of thing. So that is the main benefit in California, along with high utility rates, that's the benefit that keeps solar right. affordable. And there's a federal tax credit that's new for people. If you're a homeowner and you install a solar electric system this calendar year or next calendar year, there's a $2,000 tax credit that you can use to help offset any taxes that you owe for that year. Right. Well, it seems like, uh, well, I know, uh, that just to let the viewers know, this is something that I personally considered and went ahead and installed the system. I'm very pleased with it and uh, feel like, uh, you know, not only does it uh, in time pay me back, but uh, it, it produces considerably less pollution because it's, it, uh, essentially I'm not, um, I, I am not putting CO2 in the atmosphere uh, because I'm actually generating my own electricity and selling it back to PG&E. Mm -hmm. we, we like to tell folks, uh, picture those solar panels as gigantic pollution sponges that you're putting up on your roof mm -hmm. or, or out in your yard. Um, and the interesting thing that not a lot of folks are aware of is that the, the status quo for producing and consuming electricity in America right now is using natural gas, coal, or nuclear power at a power plant and then trucking the electricity down the power lines to your house. And in that process, 75% of the energy content that was in that initial fuel is wasted. Mm. And not a lot of people are aware that the current technology for producing most of the electricity in the country is boiling water. Whether you're heat burning coal, <laughs> burning natural gas, even what's considered this fancy new technology of a nuclear power plant, it's actually just using the heat from the, that nuclear fuel source to boil water, which turns into steam, which turns some fan blades, turbine blades, which makes a magnet spin inside a coil, electricity comes out the side. In that process, you lose two thirds of the energy, just taking your initial fuel, burning it, boiling water, taking the steam, making something spin. And then after you truck it down the power lines, there's even further loss just to get it all the way down here. So right. for every 100 watt light bulb someone turns on in America, you're asking for 400 watts of energy to be consumed in the power plant. So when you're producing your own electricity with a solar electric system, you're not just offsetting your own usage, you're actually offsetting four times as much energy as being saved from being put in a power plant far away, right. brought to your house. I, I like to tell people, 
those, those uh, extension cords out there, the, <laughs> the utility lines out there, they're like gigantic orange extension cords mm -hmm. that are really intended to truck all the power down to us. So. It really fits into the framework of uh, centralized versus decentralized. The whole uh, movement is to sort of empower local communities to be self-sufficient or more self-sufficient, more self-sustaining. If we produce our own electrical energy, it's much more efficient. Mm -hmm. And, and it also it sets us up in a way that should something happen with the centralized plants, we're actually in a much better position to uh, sur survive, sustain ourselves. Mm -hmm. In some cases, um, homeowners that have installed solar electric systems with batteries included for backup power in case the power lines go down, those homes have survived hurricanes and have survived forest fires. A few years ago, there was a, uh, an image put out by this one solar company that had done this installation of a blackened community in Southern California. But there was this one home that was untouched and it had a solar electric system that allowed the water pumps and the hoses and everything to continue to function mm -hmm. and they were able to spare their home. So in some cases, it can make the difference between losing a home to wildfire or not. Right. It's, it's the equivalent essentially of having your own generator. You know, people who in the winter time uh, you know, they have generators installed, so should the power go out, they can fire them up and they're okay. And in this sense, this is just another form of creating that, that same kind of self-contained system. Mm -hmm. With no moving parts, with no maintenance, um, no pollution, no noise, no fuel costs over the lifetime of that generator in order to keep it running. We tell folks with every solar generator that you buy from us, we'll give you a free lifetime supply of fuel. <laughs> All you want, as long as the sun's shining. Right, as long as the sun is shining. And there's a lot of folks that, that understand that there can be some economic benefits and even environmental benefits, but really there are so many trickle down effects of choosing to generate your own electricity on site. For instance, um, generating jobs, creating jobs helping the economy because if you save money in your pocket that's more money that you can also spend in the community as opposed to sending to the utility company. Um, there's, uh, there's in addition to the economic benefits to the, the, the public there's also the sales tax generated by the sale of the solar system. You know, People take that monthly check, they send it to PG&E, there's not necessarily any local jobs created, there's no pollution saved and there's no sales tax on that. But if someone decides to buy a solar system and finance it with monthly payments, they can have no effect on their budget and they can help create jobs, generate sales tax, mm -hmm. uh, decrease pollution, increase the efficiency of the grid. So mm -hmm. what, what I like to tell people is even if when the numbers pan out that solar might be a little bit more expensive than what you're paying to your utility company, it's important to recognize that the electrons from a solar system are doing far more work than the electrons from PG&E. In reality, you just want your stuff to turn on. Mm -hmm. You're not asking it to do this other work, but um, the PG&E electron is creating more pollution and creating more hassle in some cases with the need to prop up the utility grid and the prices of it are constantly going up. Whereas if you're looking at hiring a solar electron, it's gonna do all this extra work that makes it worth it in some cases. I, I like to tell people, Think of it as the story of two workers. If you were hiring, look at hiring a painter, and you could hire one painter that would do a good job painting, but they'd drive over your lawn, knock over your trash cans, hit your cat, smoke cigarettes while they're working, and, and ditch the butts on the side. They're, they're leaving things kind of in worse shape in some cases, and their prices are constantly going up over time. That's the utility worker. Or if you were interviewing this other painter, and they would do the same job painting, but they'd actually bring your trash cans in and water your lawn and, and do all this other work that improved your life more than what you would ask them to do, wouldn't they be worth more? And people should think of themselves if they were at an interview and they know they'd show up on time and look good and, and leave the place uh, better than they found it, they'd feel like they'd be worth more than someone who was interviewing for the same job that was doing a worse job. So, I, you know, I, I, I would love it if people would let go of the concept that renewable energy electricity must be the same price as utility power. Because I'd say to them that it's doing far more work for us as a society, and therefore it's, it's worth more. Uh, when I think of uh, the, the option of 
if something is wrong and I try to rectify it by going to PG&E or rectify it by going to a local vendor, I'm going to get much better service generally, not always, but mm -hmm. much better service generally out of dealing with someone locally. The whole idea that, um, uh, you know, much like uh, local TV, I mean, we're, we are, uh, we're not uh, as energy efficient as we could be, and, and energy isn't the issue. It's just the idea that uh, a local community, and we are certainly uh, a community uh, and, and active in various ways, a local community can provide for its own needs and grow its own economy in much better ways than ways dictated by the state or the federal government. Mm -hmm. Even though the state and federal government right now are helpful, actually probably could be more helpful in terms of energy use and um, incentives, mm -hmm. but at least they're not, they're not an obstacle. Not quite. It's, it, you'd be surprised, a lot of folks are, are surprised to find out that the ability to implement a solar system is actually in some cases becoming a little bit more difficult over time instead of being made easier. Uh, permit guidelines are changing. Uh, the rebate program has even gone through changes that requires companies like ours to fill out four times as much paperwork and spend a lot more time to get the same rebate that last year took far less paperwork. And we're still hoping that the, the outcry against government regulations that you hear a lot in political circles will trickle down to the solar industry. And while we're happy for the government incentives that are there, um, in some cases it's frustrating when citizens say, well, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't need to be subsidized, or most of the subsidy programs are intended to decrease over time, saying we want to get to the point where it's a mature, self-sustaining industry, but there's no such thing as an unsubsidized energy market mm -hmm. in this country. Even the oil companies, which is the most profitable industry in the history of mankind, they're still being given subsidies. So if that industry still deserves subsidies, why in the world should solar be forced to right. you know, live without? So, we're hoping that we'll see over time less given to the industries that are mature and polluting and based on fossil fuels and it will help with solar more. That certainly makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, you, we discussed uh, an, an acronym that you created mm -hmm. uh, called PEACE and I was wondering if you could begin to elaborate on what that is. Yeah, the, the acronym PEACE came out of a need for me to give folks uh, some succinct guidance on ways that they could uh, change their energy habits because a lot of people are saying I, I understand we've got economic problems and foreign policy issues and energy issues and a lot of it could be dealt with by looking at how we use and consume energy what do I do you know tell me what to buy and I do a monthly uh, energy show on on KVMR first Thursday of every month and I get a sense of people looking for guidance you know tell me what to do and as a consumer culture people are taught to just buy 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 and we're happy to provide people with renewable energy equipment However, it's really important for folks to understand that the solutions to our, our climate issues and our energy issues are not just found in technology, it's habits coupled with technology. Right. And so the acronym PEACE was intended to serve as a way for people to um, know exactly what is entailed in, in making a smooth transition in their lifestyle without feeling like I've got to do some drastic changes or, or buy a lot of equipment. So here's what it stands for, P-E-A-C-E stands for practicing energy awareness, conservation, and efficiency. And it's actually in a specific chronological order. There are some people that criticize folks that buy a large solar electric system and don't try and conserve or become more efficient beforehand. Um, that, that they feel like they can buy the system and then use as much power as they want. And so what people should understand is that first comes awareness. You have to understand that there are alternatives to the way that you use energy and that there are consequences to the way that we use energy, whether it's uh, you know, wars over resources or whether it's extra pollution, um, whether it's understanding that when you plug in a light bulb here, it requires four times as much energy there. First you need that awareness before people want to change. So after you've got your energy awareness down, understanding that there are more efficient light bulbs and more efficient vehicles and, and ways to do things differently, then let's look at conservation. And the next step uh, of conservation means not using energy unless you absolutely have to, because now you're aware that it's creating pollution and it's creating hardships economically. 
And so that means not turning on the light bulb if you don't absolutely need it on. Or that turning it off when you're leaving the room. Exactly, yeah. Not driving uh, someplace if you don't really have to, if you're going to be going up to town later or the next day or that type of thing. Um, so after you've become aware, then choose to not use. Choose to not consume unless you absolutely have to. But let's say that you've decided, look, it's night and I want to read my book and I need to turn this light bulb on. <laughs> Fine, Mr. Peace, you know, I, what do I do now? So now the next step is efficiency. If you've decided you have to use energy in some form in your life through some action, try and use the most efficient mechanism possible. And again, with the light bulb example and the car example, um, you're aware of the impacts of turning on the light bulb. Um, you have to turn it on. You can't conserve that energy. So you put in a compact fluorescent light bulb instead of an incandescent. Or you've discovered, oh, look, I have to go someplace, but you're going to do it at a reasonable speed. You're going to do it without your roof rack on top of your car. And you're going to try and have an efficient vehicle, if at all possible. Mm -hmm. So that there's sort of steps to take. Become aware, practice energy awareness, conservation, and then efficiency. You know what I found was great after installing a solar system, uh, getting a bill each month. And you can do this whether you have a bill or not from a solar system. I mean, any PG&E bill will work. And that is to look at the bottom line and think, well, I've cut it down, you know, $10, I've cut it down $20, and being aware of the ways in which uh, the energy bill could be cut down. In the last couple of months, I've actually zeroed out, you know, nothing. There's no cost to the uh, PG&E wow. bill. And, you know, I just, you know, that's success, and, and that's the growing awareness of how to conserve and become more efficient. Mm -hmm. okay. And I like for folks to, to think of different analogies and ways to become aware. It doesn't have to be a hammering of negative consequences. You know, you better do this or else. Um, so I like, to, I like to give myself different uh, images like a pollution tap. Imagine if every house on the outside of the house, you didn't just have your hose tap, your hose faucet, but there's also a pollution tap there. And it's opened every time you turn something on that needs electricity. Every time you turn on a light in your house, you're opening that pollution tap a little bit wider and the pollution is spilling out. And if you think of it that way, you're more liable to turn off the switches and things around your house because you don't want that pollution pouring out. Right. Particularly now that we're seeing more um, you know, awareness about air pollution with ozone quality in this area, mm -hmm. um, water pollution, you know, all the kinds of pollutions that uh, sort of stack up these days, but particularly vulnerable to air. And this is something that we can influence to some degree in our own community. I mean, a lot of it comes up from Sacramento and the Bay Area, you know, that, that we're trying to influence in terms of, a, you know, getting the message out to other communities. Mm -hmm. But what is it that we can actually do ourselves mm -hmm. and in terms of diminishing our own pollution? Mm -hmm. And that's where elect uh, solar electric systems actually help keep that pollution from being em emitted to the west of us in some power plants that are to the west of us, especially in the middle of summer when the power plants are looking at a shortage of electricity. They have what are called peaker plants in the Bay Area. They're essentially large jet engines that are extremely polluting, not very efficient, but they're intended to be able to switch on and off at a moment's notice. Most electrical power plants need to operate 24 hours a day, kind of at a smooth output. That's the best economic uh, model for them. And you don't want to be turning the power plant on and off. There's such a ramp up time with it. So there is some pollution saved in electricity being generated locally with renewable energy. There's a lot of focus on cars, mm -hmm. but you can save some with solar electricity. But I think more importantly than that is just setting a really good example. If, if we as a community can do what we can to show that we don't have to be driving all over creation all the time, one person to a vehicle and inefficient vehicles, and perhaps if we set a good enough example, our neighbors will take notice and we'll be able to have an influence slowly but surely, as opposed to saying, Hey, you guys to the west of us, you better stop driving. Mm -hmm. But yet we're not willing to right. do what we're asking them to do. Yeah, to a certain extent, problems uh, appear to be immense. But I've always taken the approach that you start small and, uh, you know, you, you, you maybe take care of your own family mm -hmm. and your own life and, and then your friends and, you know, and then maybe your neighbors and your community. And pretty soon, uh, the ripple effect really takes hold, particularly if a community identifies itself as one that is concerned and uh, with energy usage, and that's a primary you know, primor priority. Mm -hmm. for, for those people that feel like 
the small things like changing light bulbs or, or you know, being more efficient with your vehicle use or installing a solar electric system um, amounts to nothing. I always like to give the examples of um, uh, a burning house. If you came across a burning house and you had a little squirt bottle of water and you squirted at it and nothing happened, you might walk away thinking, well, water doesn't put out fires, when the truth is you actually need more of it. And in some cases, there are examples in nature, as it's referred to as biomimicry, looking at nature for examples in, 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 that we can apply to life. And you could walk up to a hard rock, large boulder, and you could throw a bucket of water on it and say, you know, this water, you can't change rocks with it, but you go down to the Yuba River and you see the effects of small drops of water over time are relentlessly pushing against the rock and they carve that rock and they change that rock and in some cases break it down into dust. So it's not necessarily futile for someone to do what they can. It's oftentimes a good example that then can spread and the more that people follow it, the more impact that we'll actually have. And it's, it's one of these ac actions and activities that seems to make a lot of sense in the face of uh, a world of problems. You know, this, this is something that is doable. Mm -hmm. And even if you can't afford a solar system, you can afford to turn out lights, you know, conserve your driving habits and speeds and a lot of things that slowly diminish the problem. Mm -hmm. They add up quite a bit. And um, it's important for people, too, to understand that whenever you buy something, whenever you eat something, your consumption habits are like a remote control that makes other humans drive for you. Instead of just always focusing on, well, I have to drive a certain amount, I can't save that much oil. When you eat food or buy things that have traveled a long distance, you're asking planes and trains and cars to drive farther for you. Right. So our consumption habits, think of them like a remote control button. And how much do you want everyone else to drive for you? And that can have a good impact. And that brings up the, really the issue that uh, our communities are so involved in right now, and that's the uh, uh, community service agriculture, you know, CSAs. Uh, and uh, growing local foods and um, trying to be as independent and self-sufficient as possible. It really creates you know, a ripple effect that if other communities are doing the same thing, we are becoming uh, much less polluting, much less energy consuming. And insulating our, for me it's a layer of insulation around our community against the problems of the outside world. Wars and famine and energy and all these types of things. If we can be as efficient and dependent on ourselves locally as possible, it's like a layer of insulation. And people should think of their county, they should think of their property lines as their own country. Mm -hmm. Instead of complaining about politicians in D.C., they should make the country a, an energy exporter, not an importer, and that type of thing. Well, do it with your own house. You are, we're each our own country, and we can each set our own example. I'm going to choose to use renewable energy, and I'm going to be an efficient person. And, I'm going to run my personal country the way that I feel like the larger world should operate. Well, I want to thank you, Martin. It's been a pleasure talking, and uh, I hope that we can do this again um, because this issue isn't going to go away, not, not anytime soon anyway. And I also want to thank um, Ben Menzies and Aaron Gallagher and Karen Johnson and uh, the volunteers who helped make NCTV possible. Please uh, come by, become a member, and support your local public access TV station. Thank you. providing clean and healthy drinking and irrigation water to more than 24,000 homes, farms, schools, and businesses in Nevada and Placer counties.